Welcome, I'm Ryan Holger with Temperature Equipment Corporation and this topic that we're doing for you guys today is psychrometrics. This is a two-part series. There is a uh, one and a half hour topic today and another one and a half hour topic next week. So two-part series. Um, there's a little bit of housekeeping stuff here. Um, one, I have like 250 people on this webinar, which is like 150 more than a normal webinar. So I may not be able to get to all your questions that you guys type in. Go ahead and type them in. I'll try my best. Um, we'll try to get as many of them answers as we can, but there's a lot of people on here. So it might be a little bit challenging on my end. Uh, the second thing is several of you folks uh, needed PDH hours. So when you registered, you would have been asked if you needed PDH hours to check this box down here. If you needed PDHs for Illinois or Wisconsin, when you do that and you want to actually get a certificate from us, if you read the rules, there's a couple of rules. One, you have to attend both sessions this week and next Monday to get PDHs. Two, you have to answer the quiz questions. There'll be eight quiz questions in total between the two days. They are not hard. They are just there to make sure that you are live, breathing, and actually watching as opposed to logged in and then you and then you went to the bar, you know, if the bar was open. You only have to get five of the eight questions correct, which is 62%, and they are pretty easy questions. So. If you're not needing PDHs, that's fine. You can still answer the questions. That's cool. I don't mind it. I like it. Um, but if you need the PDHs, you have to answer the questions. You have to be logged in on your own computer. You can't be sharing with another person because then only one of you is going to get credit. I say all that because after these classes, somebody always complains they didn't get a certificate and they don't understand why. So now you'll hopefully understand what you need to do. Someone will still complain, I'm sure. All right. So to our slides, when you see it, it pop up like this, I will launch the quiz question. You guys will have about a minute or so to answer it. Um, I will probably read off the questions that you guys asked me at that same time. Uh, that kind of works out pretty good. So with that, we're going to continue on. Uh, I do need to have one other disclaimer for you guys. Um, this presentation is normally a four-hour live person class that we do every year. Um, I'm trying to adapt it for online, so it might not be quite smooth and perfect because some of the things that I would normally draw out on the whiteboard for you will be difficult to do. And normally I would pass out a bunch of psych charts to everybody and have you do all the same calcs that I'm doing, which is very hard for me to do as well. I did in the handout section of GoToWebinar, I did put a psych chart on there as a PDF that you can grab and download. So on the right hand panel of your screen, uh, you'll see that section for handouts. If you don't see a handout section, up at the top of GoToWebinar, hit the little view where it says File Options View Help, hit View and make sure you check all the boxes, specifically in this case, the chat box and the handout box, uh, and then you'll be able to see those things. All right, so today and next Monday, our lineup, uh, we're gonna do some properties of air and water vapor. We're gonna build the psychrometric chart. That means we're gonna start off with a clean slate and start adding all of the lines on there and explaining what the various lines mean and represent. We're gonna talk about how to plot state points on the chart, and then I'm gonna dive more so next week uh, into the air conditioning related processes and how they work on the psych chart. So cooling, dehumidifying, humidifying, heating, evaporative cooling towers, all that kind of stuff on the psych chart. All right. So our initial objectives, we need to understand the properties of water and vapor, water vapor and air mixtures. We're going to build a chart. Uh, we're going to use that chart to determine the properties. This is, by the way, the, one of the most exciting topics that we do is the psychrometric chart. I can't believe 250 people logged in for this. I thought it'd be like nine. Uh, I'm going to make it as fun as possible, I promise. Um, we're going to use the chart to understand the air conditioning process, uh, and then we're going to use the, the processes and, that we've just learned um, to kind of explain how that will apply to cooling coils specifically and also other types of equipment. All right, so the study of psychrometrics. If you did not know, Willis Carrier is the founder of the psychrometric chart. He obviously didn't invent properties of air and water vapor, but he's the one that did all the research studies to collect the data and then plot it all out, invented this chart to kind of represent it all in one place, and then used that chart in all of his designs. And then the entire industry used that chart in all of their designs. And in fact, we still do. Sometimes we nowadays, like a lot of times nowadays, we use a computer to do a lot of this for us. And that's great. Computers are fantastic, obviously. Uh, and they can take care of the heavy lifting for us. But sometimes you got to step back and understand how things work without the computer. So that way, when the computer spits out an answer that is totally wrong, you can do a reality check and be like, what the hell? That's not right. So you need to have some basic understanding of these things. 
And by the way, when a computer spits out the wrong answer, it's probably because you put the wrong input in. But you got to understand these properties. It's kind of like forcing you to do long division before we hand you the calculator. And then in second grade, we hand you the calculator and you're like, what the hell, man? Where was this all my life? That's what this is like. All right, so we're going to do it the hard way. So later on, the easy way, computer and plotting it that way, uh, will make more sense to you. So some of the things that psychometric chart and psychometrics in general are going to help us with, uh, we'll be able to determine the temperature at which condensation will occur on ducts and in hidden cavities and walls. Uh, that's going to be very beneficial to us. Obviously, if we know condensation is going to occur, we want to do things to prevent that. Change temperatures, change humidities, insulate things. Uh, we want to be able to avoid that. So if we can plot it out, we'll know when that happens. Uh, we want to find out all the properties of air by knowing just two conditions. Some things are really easy to measure, like temperature. Other stuff, like specific humidity, BTUs per pound of dry air, that kind of stuff is really hard to measure. So if we can measure other things in the field and use that to plot everything on the chart, we can thereby get all of the other data points that we want. That's going to be one of the benefits to psychometrics for us. We'll be able to calculate the CFM we needed to run our cooling equipment for both the equipment and what we need to put into the space, right? The, the BTUs we need come from our load calc, and that's a separate class, which we'll probably end up doing during this uh, quarantine time also. Um, the BTUs come from, from the load calc, but the CFM that we need to move the BTUs will come from the psychometric study. Uh, we'll be able to determine the sensible and latent loads on the cooling coil, so we know what kind of cooling coil we need. And we'll use that information to determine the depth, fins per inch, and those kind of things. Obviously, the psychometrics that we're talking about will apply to other processes, heating and humidity and all that kind of stuff, and we'll go through those. Um, but cooling is a big focus of it because a lot of commercial buildings obviously are cooling dominant. So we'll do a lot of it from the perspective of cooling, and cooling is also more complicated than heating. I'll do it from the perspective of cooling, and then heating will be pretty easy to understand after that. All right. so. Our, uh, our first section that we're going to really dive in here, properties of air and water vapor. So if you didn't already know it, you probably do because most of you guys are pretty smart. Um, air, dry air specifically, is a composi composition of multiple gases. It is mostly nitrogen. That is the primary component of our atmosphere. Uh, oxygen, the part that we need as human beings to survive, is relatively small compared to nitrogen. Uh, usually oxygen, depending on where you're at, is somewhere between like 19 and 21 and a half percent, um, but those are pretty normal ratios. And then all of the other gases, carbon dioxide, which is what plants need, obviously, um, pollutants, VOCs, everything else jams into that little 1%. So if we know what nitrogen and oxygen are doing from a molecular weight type standpoint, uh, it's pretty easy to understand some of these processes. In addition to the gases, if you notice that said composition of dry air, Air is not going to be perfectly dry. We're not walking around in air that is 0% humidity. That's really, really dry. I mean, Vegas comes damn close, but even that has a little tiny bit of moisture in the air. So that's dry air, but real air that we're used to working with has water vapor in the air. Air molecules will spread themselves out equally. They'll move left and right, front and back, up and down. Water mixed into the air, water vapor, is going to do the exact same thing. The air molecules. So every little bit of nitrogen and oxygen and so forth, they all want to be, mm, what's the best way to say it, equidistant from each other. So they spread out to be equally spread out and distant from each other. The water vapor fills in the cracks. So it's a pretty, pretty good mixture. Uh, it's not like the water vapor is up high at the ceiling or down at the floor or anything weird like that. The water vapor moves up and down, left and right and front and back to fill up the whole volume of the space. We're mainly talking about indoors here, although outdoors it would work the same way. Uh, but if you start getting really, really high up into the sky, the pressure makes a difference. And we'll talk about that later. But if you're inside, the distance in your 10-foot ceilings is not going to be enough pressure difference for it to matter. So for now, let's just understand that the water vapor fills the space just like the dry air fills the space. So if we take a pound of dry air or a pound of wet air, this is usually in my live class where I try to trick people and get them to tell me which one actually weighs more. Uh, but you guys are too smart for that. Plus, I can't see who falls for it, and I can't pick on you because you're all remote, which really ruins the fun for me today. Um, but what weighs more, a pound of dry air, a pound of wet air? Obviously, the answer is they're the same. Both weigh one pound. Uh, a pound of wet air has less dry air in it, if you will. So in this example here, um, 0.9978 pounds of dry air and 0.0022 pounds of water mixed into it. 
equals a total of one pound of wet air. In a pound of air, in a pound of dry, uh, in a pound of wet air, we have 7,000 grains of moisture. What the hell is a grain? This is like one of the most complicated units of measurement for anyone to understand. Uh, and you can't even really measure it in the field, which makes it even harder to understand. So what happens in my brain, which is not right, but this is what happens in my brain. I envision a grain of moisture as one water droplet. It's not a water droplet, but in my brain, that is what it is. So it's 7,000 little water droplets sitting in this little box that I'm holding here, this little rectangular box. 7,000 little water droplets are sitting in there. So 7,000 grains of moisture. We're gonna use those grains of moisture frequently as we talk about the psychometrics and the psychometric chart. So where does this water come from? We have water mixed in the air, great, understood, right? But some places, Miami has a lot more water vapor than other places, Las Vegas. So where the hell is this moisture coming from? So outdoors, the moisture obviously comes from rain, snow, sleet, all that precipitation. And it also comes from bodies of water. So you're probably smart enough to know that if you go to somewhere near the coast, there'll be more water in the air. Like if you go to Florida, there'll be more water in the air than if you're in, say, Kansas on a typical day. Obviously, if it's raining, it's different. Um, areas that have large bodies of water, like the Great Lakes, um, that water that water gets evaporated up into the air, which we'll talk about why that happens. Uh, it gets evaporated up into the air and makes the air more moist. So the air is pulling moisture out of the bodies of water. Inside, which is mostly what we're concerned with because we haven't figured out how to do HVAC for outdoors very well yet. So inside, where does the moisture come from? Uh, depends on the application and what you're doing, but let's just start with say your house. Uh, most of the moisture in a house comes from your showering, baths, things like that, laundry, and cooking. Assuming you're cooking on the stove with with a pot of water type of thing. Um, other places, some projects, like if you're doing a fitness center project, a lot of the moisture comes out of the human body. The more you sweat, obviously that moisture goes somewhere. Where does it go? It goes into the air. So if we're doing a fitness center project, we deal with humidity and, we can, and we're concerned with that much differently than say an office building because of the amount of perspiration people are having. Um, but some spaces, locker rooms, fitness centers, school gymnasiums, uh, restaurants, uh, laundromats, those places will have different indoor humidity concerns than other quote unquote standard spaces like offices, uh, retail, things like that. We have two of the uh, laws that are going to come into play in our discussions here. So we need to explain these now. So later on in the course, they make sense to you. Uh, the first one is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Or I guess on here they have it as PV equals WRT. Back in the 90s, when I was in high school, we learned it as NRT. I have no idea why. Some of these are, are obvious things. P is pressure. V is volume of the space that we're talking about. T is temperature. Um, w is, or N, depending on how you look at it, is the weight of whatever it is that we have, whatever gas we're looking at. And then R is just this sloppy mess of, of constant multiples to make all these units work out mathematically. Um, so it's always gonna be the same um, for any given uh, any given gas that you have. So that's one law that'll come into play. And we use the same thing in refrigerant, PV equals NRT. We kind of ignore the N and the R and we say pressure times volume equates to temperature. And the volume is fixed on a refrigeration system. So when pressure goes up, temperature goes up. It's how your condenser works. Um, if you need help with that, we have videos and we have uh, webinars on all that stuff too. That's our ideal gas law as a reminder for you. Then we have Dalton's law. So this law states that air and water vapor together occupy the same volume as they would by themselves. So if we go back a little bit to there, that air up in the top left box and that water in, in the bottom right box, when they combine, they do not take up any additional space. Like I said, the water squeezes in the gaps in between the various air molecules. No additional space, i.e. volume is needed. So if I have uh, a pound of uh, air and a pound of water vapor and I put them together, I got two pounds of stuff fitting in the exact same box, if you want to think of it that way. That means the pressure is actually going to be able to uh, be the sum of each of those two things. We can measure temperature and we can measure pressure, obviously. Um, and you can also get those from your weather app and the news. If Anyone still watches the news? Obviously, the past two weeks you watched the news again, but up until then, the news has been a dead thing. Um, but every day you know, on, on the Weather Channel or whatever, they tell you the temperature, they tell you the humidity, they tell you the barometric pressure, 
right? And that's for, well, that's for a reason. The barometric pressure makes a difference on the moisture that we can deal with. Or more importantly, the moisture changes the barometric pressure, which is why barometric pressure can be used to predict if it's going to actually be a, a, a precipitation day or not. The atmosphere pressure that we're dealing with is a result of the weight of the air. Now you're thinking, well, air doesn't weigh anything, doesn't really affect my scale, it's pretty much negligible. Yeah, it pretty much is negligible when everything you're dealing with is at the exact same height. But as you go higher up into the air, so up in the top of a high rise building, up on top of a mountain, up in an airplane, up in, in the sky, there's less weight above you from the air. There's less air above you, so there's less weight pushing down on you. Whereas you go down to the to the sea level or go down into a valley, there's more weight from the air pushing down on you. So the altitude, the height, does affect the pressure. It's not going to be a huge deal for our calculations because most of you guys on this webinar are working in the Chicagoland area, and we are at what is it, 650 some feet above sea level, which, in the purpose of HVAC, which is you know. Horseshoes and hand grenades kind of thing. Uh, HVAC is not overly precise compared to some of the scientific fields out there. So 600 feet above sea level, that's basically sea level as far as I'm concerned. So you don't really have to do much adjusting for the altitude here. But if you do a job in Denver, okay, then it's going to be a little bit different. But here, it's I don't, I don't want to say it's negligible, but it's almost negligible. Um, when we look at pressure. Um, and this, I realize my slides are from 2004, and I apologize for that. This is part of our fundamentals series that we call Technical Development Program. Um, I've been teaching that class for mm, maybe 10 years. Um, other people have taught it before that. When I started here 22 years ago, they were teaching that class. Um, and 20 years before that, they were teaching that class. It's been around forever. And we've been doing it for 40 some years at TEC. In any case, it's the fundamentals class, and the fundamentals never change because they're the fundamentals. So we don't update the slides very often. <laughs> so my slides are a little dated. By that I mean, good luck finding yourself a mercury pressure scale like we have here. Um, but for conceptual sake, uh, most of you would be using manometers to measure this stuff now, um, digital manometers. But in this case, I have a column of mercury. Um, obviously the column has a cap on it, and then the sides are open to the atmospheric pressure. So as the atmospheric pressure, the weight of the air above me is pushing down on that mercury, it shoves it up that column. And then there'll be graduated lines on the column that allow me to measure. So in this case, um, if I have, uh, if that column raises 30 inches, that equates to 14.7 PSI, that's our atmospheric pressure. If I am further up in above uh, sea level, somewhere high, right, top of a high rise building, up in the mountains or something like that, then I would have less pressure on there. So you can see that's gonna start affecting me. Instead of 14.7, now I have 12.7. Like I said, for, for Chicagoland, it's pretty flat here. Uh, so it's probably like 14.5 something, which is pretty, pretty similar. So one of the questions that we'll try to uh, answer as we, as we move along here is uh, what's gonna actually weigh more, dry air or wet air? Um, and it's a, it's a challenging uh, conversation to have, especially when I can't draw it on the board for you guys today. Um, but dry air is uh, is more dense. Let me uh, pull up this other piece here to kind of show you that if I can. Can, maybe we can. Mm. I don't know how well I can pull it up. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard to pull up. All right, let's just use this example then. I'll just verbally give you an example. So when we listen to like the weather report or look at our weather app, they say it's going to be a nice, clear, sunny day. Um, and there's a high pressure front with rising barometer. I don't know if you guys have heard them say things like that. The pressure is rising. There's a high pressure front coming in. Whereas if you are talking about a bad weather situation like a hurricane, they'll say that it's very low pressure. And that's because the dry air is denser. So the dry air actually weighs more than the moist air. So that's why the dry air has a higher pressure, the moist air has a lower pressure. This is true since the pound of atmospheric air the water vapor occupies is a greater percentage of the volume and hence weighs less. So dry air is denser than moist air. It's kind of a quirky way to think about it. Let me put my slides back up here. I should have did that, sorry. Um, 
We, the industry, have agreed upon a standard definition of what air is. So for purposes of our discussion today and the psychometric chart, we're going to be dealing with air at sea level at 14.7 PSI at 59 degree dry bulb. That's going to be our standard air. I'm going to use that as our reference point. Everything's going to be based off of that. So with that, we have our very first quiz question. And once again, for you guys that are uh, going to need PDHs, you have to answer the questions um, or you're not going to get PDHs, obviously. For everybody else, you can answer them just for fun. Like I said, these questions aren't hard. They're just to make sure you guys are alive and paying attention. So question number one for our quiz, who created the first psychometric chart? That should be up on the screen there. You can click your answer. Um, we'll give it a, a few minutes here. While you guys are looking at that and answering that, I am going to open up the question box on my end and see if you sent me any questions. Holy cow, there's a lot. All right. Um, seems like at 10.08 something happened and we lost audio, but now it sounds like everybody says we're good. Not sure what's going on with the audio there. Hmm. What the hey? Let me move the microphone a little bit. See if we can get it to a better spot here. Hopefully that'll help out. Oh my God, there's so many questions on here. All right, I'm gonna leave this quiz question up for you guys. I'm gonna mute myself and see what I can do differently on the sound. Uh, give me 60 seconds. All right, can you guys hear the sound now? If someone could let me know if the sound is good again. It looked like it was good for like eight minutes and then kind of dropped out. I think I might have had that fixed. I totally apologize for that. You just had like five minutes of extreme boredom, I'm sure. Uh, all right, everybody's typing in that sounds good, so we're going to roll with that. Uh, I will try to uh, watch the question box a little better in case the sound uh, does drop back out again. All right, so the quiz question, I need to close that. All right, uh, let's see. It's like 83% of you voted, uh, and the correct answer is, in fact, B, Willis Carrier. 89% of you got that correct. The people that checked the train box are probably just screwing with me. Thanks a lot. All right, we're going to go back into our presentation here. Hopefully that screen pops back up here. All right, so let's build this psychometric chart. So we're going to start off pretty basic. This is what the chart looks like if you haven't seen it before. And like I said, there's one in the handout box that you can click on and download as a PDF. I apologize for being kind of small, but uh, that's about all I can put on a PDF. Uh, all right, so the bottom scale. And I'm going to try to use my, uh, my John Madden thing here. My little, uh, my little pen thing. So on the bottom scale, 
down here. That doesn't really work. Highlighter. That doesn't really work well either. Come on, John. There we go. That's the one we need. All right, so on the bottom scale, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees. This is dry bulb temperature in Fahrenheit. Each one of those lines goes vertically up. So that's the 50 degree line, 70 degree line, 110 degree line, and so on. The wet bulb temperatures are on this curve over here. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 85. That's going to be our wet bulb. I'm going to keep building upon that. So we're going to add specific humidity to discussion. So over here on the, on the right-hand side, so our vertical axis is temperature. Our horizontal axis is specific humidity, 40, 60, 80 grains of moisture. All right. Um, so those are the two pure things we have. That's why they're straight lines. The chart is based on dry bulb temperature and grains of moisture, just like everything we talked about in the previous slides, assuming you could hear me on that audio, those are the two things that we're going to think about. There's going to be lots of other stuff we're going to add to this plot, but those are going to be our two, two main things. All right, start adding stuff on here. So to plot one of these points, I'm going to measure 75 degrees. Great, got that. Let's assume for the moment that I know how to measure grains of moisture, which I don't, but if I did, if I take those two things and plot them across, I pick a point on there where my red dot's at, that's pretty easy. All right, so I got that point plotted. Once I have that, from that one point, I'll be able to read everything else that we're going to eventually build onto this chart. So let's start building some of the things on this chart. So you'll notice that the chart has this curve over here, and then there's nothing over here on the left-hand side. This curve is when I'm fully saturated, meaning that the air is holding the absolute maximum amount of moisture that it could possibly hold. It could not take one more drop if you begged it. It is 100% humidity, can't handle any more moisture. If somehow it was asked to hold some more moisture, something would condense out and fall, right? So we don't bother building the chart over here on the left-hand side because for HVAC purposes, we cannot have anything be super saturated. So we don't even bother building it. That's why we have this curve here. So this curve is the 100% humidity line. It is the saturation curve, the saturation line, any of those names that you choose to use. All right, so we got the 100% humidity line. Now we can start adding the other humidity lines, 90, 80, 70, 60, all the way down to 10% humidity here. So we can add any of those lines on there. Now the humidity lines are all curved. My slides are going faster than I can speak. Uh, the humidity lines are all curved because they are relative. So we call it relative humidity. The relative humidity is relative to the temperature. Warmer air can hold more moisture. Cooler air holds less moisture. So that's why we have these curved lines on there. So someone telling you that it's 80% humidity outside is absolutely worthless information unless you also know the temperature outside, right? Because 80% in the summer and 80% in the winter mean two very different things. We can plot various data points on here. So for example, we had that 75 degree temperature with that 60 grains of moisture. If I were to plot that on here, you'd say it's about 45% humidity at that, at that scenario. If I was to go all the way to the left on the chart, you'd see I'd be partway between the 50 and 60. So 53 or so is when I would hit the 100% humidity line. So if I had 60 grains of moisture at 75 degrees out, that's 45% humidity. If the temperature starts dropping, like it does say in the evening, temperature drops and drops and drops and drops and drops. When it gets to 53 degrees, it is gonna be 100% saturated. I am at the dew point. The dew point is the dry bulb temperature at which I am 100% humidity. That's what the dew point is. Um, and they call it the dew point, obviously, because that's the point we start making dew, which will be condensation. So dew on your car windshield or grass blades or anything like that, that's a function of it being a certain humidity. It gets cooler in the evening, and then things start condensing when they hit that dew point. All right, if I took a different example on here, say, for example, 50 grains of moisture instead of 60, then my dew point is actually lower, 48 degrees. If I only had 40 grains of moisture, so two thirds of what I started with at the 60, I gotta get all the way down to 42 before I'm gonna hit the dew point. So the amount of moisture that I have in the air will determine at what point I'm going to kind of condensate. 
So where does that come into play with HVAC? It actually comes into play in a lot of places, such as evaporator coils, or in this common example, uh, we use it to figure out if we're going to have a problem with ducts going through an unconditioned space, like ducts through an attic or something like that. So in this particular scenario, I have a 55 degree duct running through, say, an attic. The attic is 95 degrees with 100 grains of moisture. It's a very hot attic, obviously. So if I plot those things out, let's say 95 degrees and 100 grains of moisture, I'm only at 40% humidity. Doesn't sound like a problem to me. No big deal, right? Only 40% humidity. I don't understand why there's moisture in my attic. But if I run a 55 degree duct through that attic, then those 100 grains of moisture on the outside of the duct, touching the 55 degree duct surface, or maybe the surface is 57, right? 55 in the duct, and the temperature transfers through the duct. Maybe it's a slightly warmer, but let's just pretend it's 55 for right now. 100 grains of moisture can only hold, if I go all the way to the left, to the saturation line, can get 100% saturated at 67 degrees. So if anything goes in that attic that's below 67 degrees, condensation is going to form on it. So if you go up in the 95 degree attic, holding uh, a nice ice cold can of beer, yeah, it's going to condense. Water bottle, yeah, it's going to condense. 55 degree duct, yeah, it's going to condense. So in order to avoid that from happening, we might choose to insulate the duct uh, as an option on there. We're not going to make the duct be higher than 67 degrees in this case because it's going to be hard to cool the space with, with 68 degree air. That's just a practical example of what I can use this chart for in relation to dew point. I'm going to go ahead and look at the question box just to make sure my sound's not jacked up. And no one has complained about sound lately, so I think we're probably okay for now. And we'll keep on, keep on plodding along. So the relative humidity lines that I mentioned, they're the curve lines, 90, 80, 70, 60% there on the curvature. If you wanted to figure it out mathematically, if I took my 75 degree day with 60 grains of moisture and I plotted that out over here, I said it was about 45% because I eyeballed it on here. But there's other ways I could look at that. I could say that 75 degree air, if I went all the way straight up and hit the 100% humidity line, and then I went straight across, and I'm, my straight is pretty, pretty bad, I know. It would be able to hold 132 grains of moisture. So 75 degree air has the ability to hold 132 little tiny water droplets that we call grains of moisture. So it can hold 132. I have 60. I have 60 out of a maximum of 132. 60 divided by 132, 45% relative humidity. I am 45% of the way of being fully saturated. I'm holding 45% of the maximum humidity. Arrow. All right, so another example here. I have a window. It's winter time. My window's cold. Maybe it's, I don't know, uh, zero degrees outside. So the inside surface of my window is 35 degrees. What's going to happen? So in this case, I have a 75 degree room. And I have a 35 degree window. 75 degree room and 35 degree window. If I draw all the way across over here, 35, that dew point, I can read it here straight up. I can also write it here. You can't see it. 30 and 40, halfway between, but in 35, I can read it there. That 35 degree window, 23% humidity is where I'm going to be at on here. So if I was to have my humidifier set higher or lower, that could cause a problem with condensating on my window. If I try to add more moisture to this, this guy can only hold 23. 75 degrees is only going to be able to hold this at 35 degree surface temperature, only going to be able to handle 23% humidity. If I was to run my humidifier at 30%, it's going to be higher than that. It's going to be causing a problem. It's going to cause me to condense on the window. If I keep it below 23%, like I said, it for 20, I'll be fine. So let's take a look at this process here. Oh, I don't know what I just clicked on. Uh, all right, so we have air coming in the air handler. Uh, the air is going from left to right on the air handler here. So air is going through this way. We've got a fan system and everything pushing air through there. What I have coming into the air handler is 75 degree air with 60 grains of moisture, 45% relative humidity. The same air we were talking about a few minutes ago. I'm going to have in this case, uh, whatever you want to call it. If you are from the from Arizona, you might call it a swamp cooler, which is kind of a derogatory term. You might call it an adi adiabatic cooling system. But I'm going to spray moisture into this airstream. What's going to happen when I spray moisture into the airstream? It's going to increase the amounts of grains of moisture. I'm going to go from 60 to 82 grains in this case. 
I'm going to be 100% saturated because I just soaked this, this air with water. But my dry bulb and wet bulb temperature are going to go down. I'm going to cool the air. Yeah, it's going to be cool and humid, but it's going to be cool. Um, in places like Arizona, where it's really dry in the space, that works out fine. If I throw you 61 degree air that's humid, by the time it comes into the space and mixes with my dry air, it's not that humid anymore. But it did cool my air down. In places where it's already humid, St. Louis, Kansas City, Florida, that's not going to work. We're going to explain how this process works on the psychometric chart as we continue on here. Um, but I'm going to be able to plot all this kind of stuff out and really kind of make it obvious on how it all how it all happens. So measuring temperature in the space is pretty easy. Just need a thermometer, right? Um, measuring other points is very difficult. Measuring relative humidity, difficult. Grains of moisture, difficult. Dew point, difficult. Historically, measuring wet bulb was the easiest thing we could measure in addition to dry bulb temperature. So that's how we did it. Now you all have digital uh, uh, temperature gauges. I'm, I have a fluke one that, that tells me everything, dew point, humidity, wet bulb, everything on one screen instantly. It's fantastic. But historically, what we did is use a sling psychrometer. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these, you should get your hands on one. It's super fun. Um, you know, as fun as nerdy HVAC can get. So inside the sling psychrometer, there's actually two temperature bulbs in there. One is a dry bulb, one is a wet bulb. The wet bulb essentially gets a little wet sock put on it. And what you do is you go outside or inside, depending on what you're trying to measure, and you swing this thing above your head, crank it around to draw air across it. And that air, that velocity of air, has a wicking effect on that little wet sock and pulls the moisture and the heat out of the second thermometer. And then I'll be able to read on the gauge two different things, the dry bulb on the dry thermometer and the wet bulb on the wet thermometer. That is, in fact, why we call it the dry bulb and the wet bulb. Literally, the bulb of the thermometer is wet or it's not wet. It's nothing more fun than that. That's really what the name comes from. So you would do that. You'd swing it around above your head, and then you plot it on the psych chart because the wet bulb was easy to get as long as you don't mind standing in someone's front yard swinging this thing around your head uh, and then plot everything else out. So my wet bulb process. The wet bulb numbers are read on a diagonal. So like we're showing here in the red arrow, Diagonally up to the 60 in this case, or 61 in this case. It's a little difficult to tell on this tiny on this tiny little chart, but so here's my starting air that I had: 75 degrees, 45 percent humidity, 60 grains of moisture. Okay. If I were to uh, uh, read straight up. On the diagonal, and there'll be lines on the chart. We don't have it on this chart, but on the regular psych chart, there'll be lines that go straight up. If I read it diagonally up, I will get the wet bulb. If I read straight to the left, if you recall, that's how I got to the dew point temperature. The dew point and wet bulb, if you see over here, wet bulb and DP dew point are the same numbers on the chart, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 85, but they're read differently. The dew point is read straight across or straight down, I should say, um, and the wet bulb is red on the 45 degree angle upward. So if I looked right here at this dot, we started with 60 grains of moisture, 75 degrees. If I read straight across to the left, the uh, dew point is 53, we'll say. If I read on the 45 degree angle up from that same dot, the 45 degree angle up, then my uh, wet bulb is 61 degrees. So reading the same information or reading different information from the same plots on the chart by following different lines on here. Let's launch our quiz question two. All right, true or false? You need to know a minimum of three pieces of data to plot a state point. All right, this time I am gonna go back to the questions. Sounds like the audio is good right now. So we're fine there. I'm gonna to try to go back a little bit further to read some of the other questions. There's literally a couple hundred on here, so I'm not gonna get them all, obviously. Although most of them seem to be your sound sucks. So um, that one we can ignore. Sound, 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 sound. Sound, sound, sound. Okay.
Okay, it seems like I have nothing that's not related. Oh, here's one that's not related to sound. Perfect. Uh, Howard says my electron electronic psychrometer, which he hasn't used in a while, will show wet bulb and dew point. I always had thought wet bulb and dew point were the same. What's the difference? Ah, okay. I think we I think we may have just answered that. If not. Hang on a second. Somebody said that they can't check the boxes, but 81% of you have checked the box already. So Heinz is having a problem doing that. I'm not sure why you can't click on the box, but most people have already done that. I'm going to try to answer this question. In the meantime, we'll give Heinz a little few more seconds here. Um, wet pulp and dew point are the same. So the wet bulb is a, a measurement of the temperature of air that has been latently cooled. I, I don't know if this is the best way to say it. Whereas the dew point is the temperature at which you can no longer hold any moisture in the air. On the chart, they're both in the same spot as far as where you read the numbers, but one is read up and down and one is read on the diagonal. All right, I'm gonna close the poll question. Looks like 73% of you had the correct answer, which was false. You do not need three pieces of data to plot something on this chart or any chart. You only need two pieces of data to plot it. All right, state points. So on the chart, there's lots of things we can read. We already mentioned a few of them on here. Let me back over with my, you guys can see my little red arrow, hopefully. Um, hopefully. Uh, on my chart, I can read a few different things. So if I'm this middle point in the middle, where my red dot is, if I read straight down, that's dry bulb. We talked about that. I read to the right, that's specific humidity, actual grains of moisture in the air, unrelated to the temperature. If I read on the 45 degree angle, that's my wet bulb. If I read it straight across, that is my dew point. And then the relative humidity are the curve lines. We're going to add some more lines on here in a little while. Uh, some of them will be super interesting to us. Some of them will not but we're going to add a few more of them on here. If I can measure any two of these things, I'll be able to plot the other ones out like we had said. Uh, specific volume lines are on there. We're mainly not going to use these for our HVAC purposes unless we're getting super precise, which we probably won't. Like I said before, horseshoes and hand grenades, but those are read on, I don't know what angle you want to call that, 75 degree angle, I'm not sure. Um, up on the chart out there, so you can read them that way. If you need the specific volume, you probably won't. Enthalpy, we will use a lot. That's gonna come up quite a bit. The enthalpy lines are gonna be read on a 45 degree angle as well, just like the wet bulb. When I get over here to the wet bulb, I'm gonna keep on going on my chart. And there's gonna be some really, really small numbers. You're gonna need your glasses or your, uh, or your magnifying glass to see those on a chart. Really, really small numbers. That's going to be the enthalpy. Um, so we'll talk about enthalpy quite a bit as we go as we go on. Uh, uh, Matthew points out, probably to help clarify Howard's question, at 100% humidity, your wet bulb and your dew point will be the same. Right. At other humidities, they won't be, but at 100% humidity, they will be the fact the same exact number. That's a good point. All right, let's go back and do the slides. All right, sea level, we're good there. All right, so let's start plotting some of this out here. Dot. All right, 75 degrees, 50% humidity, up and right on that curve there. All right, I'm going to try to plot out uh, outdoor air and room air on, on this particular chart for us in this example. So once I know two different things, I can then find everything else. So in this case, I know that it's 50% humidity and 75 degrees. From there, I can read straight across to the left to see that it's 55 dew point. I can read on the 45 up, see that it's 62 dew point. I can keep reading along to see that it's 28 BTUs per pound for enthalpy. I can read to the right to see 55 grains. I got all those pieces of data available to me. So then I'm at, that's my room temperature, 75 degrees, 50% humidity. Now I'm gonna take some outdoor air on a hot summer day, in this case, 95 degrees and 76 wet bulb, which is pretty much the nastiest day, right? And that, so that guy is red right there. So I have those two pieces of data on here. 
And from that guy, once I know those two things, I can find everything else. I can find the dew point, grains of moisture, relative humidity, 42%. I got everything available to me once I plot two of those things. Now I'm gonna mix these two things, just like we do in an air handler. We're gonna take some of the return room air, and we're gonna take some of the outside air, and we're gonna mix those two things together. When I mix the two air streams together, assuming I give them enough distance to fully mix, they will become equal in all areas. When they first come into the air handler, they'll be a little bit stratified, right? Let's say the outside air ducts on top and the return air ducts on the bottom. I'll have cold, or in this case, excuse me, hot outside air on top, and I'll have cooler return air on the bottom, but then after enough distance, they will mix. And there's things we can do in the air handler to make sure that they mix. We can put air blenders in, we can put extra spacing sections in, uh, eventually they'll mix with the fan either way for the most part. Um, so we can mix those two airstreams together and we'll see what's going to actually happen here. So in this case, depending on how much outside air I have percentage wise will determine where I'm going to be. So my outside air was the dot on the top right there. I'm all the way down the bottom left. So because I'm closer to the return air when they mixed 78 degrees in this case, I know that I don't have very much outside air. I probably have 25% outside air. Those two things are going to mix, and we'll talk about how to do the math and figure out what the mixed air temperature is. Well, we'll do that today or, or next week. Um, but those two things mix, and I have a new state point on there when the two airstreams are fully mixed. And then once I have that new point, let's say it was 25% outside air. Here's my outside air. Here's my return air. If I have 25% outside air, I move 25% away from the return air dot. Now I'm here because I had 75% return air. The dot's closer to the return air side. And I can read all my data points from there, 57 dew point, 67 wet bulb, et cetera. All right, after I have that return air and outside air mixed together, then I'm going to cool the air and I'm going to dehumidify the air, hopefully with my evaporator coil. If you're doing things wrong, you won't really dehumidify well. Um, when I do that, and we'll explain more on the chart as we go along, but cooling, I move, um, from right to left, when I cool the air, when I dehumidify, I go from top down. So I'm gonna to go to the left some, and I'm gonna go down some. And once that um, mixed air goes through the cooling coil, I'm gonna have a new state point on here. In this case, it's gonna be 58 degree air with a 56 degree wet bulb. I can plot all the data points off of that once I have it. All right, let's do Quiz question. Oh, I did it a little bit out of order. I got three and two out of order here. Sorry about that. Let's do quiz question number two then, because I'm an idiot. I skipped one. All right. Relative humidity is relative to what? A, wind speed, B, temperature, C, time of year, D, your relatives. All right, 84% of you voted. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds, and then I'm going to close it. All right, five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer, in fact, was B. 98% uh, of you guys got that correct, as one would expect. That was not very difficult. All right, so normally in this class, um, we would do a work session where I would give you guys a couple worksheets, a psychometric chart, and have you plot a bunch of stuff out. Unfortunately, I can't really do that today. I can give you the worksheet, but you're not going to have a psych chart to plot it all out, so that's going to make it a little bit difficult. So I'm going to skip that in terms of the online class. Um, when the class is complete, the two, both sessions this week and next Monday, uh, I'll give you guys the workbook anyway, and then if you want to do some of that stuff, uh, you certainly can. All right, so let's dive into the air conditioning process. 
or processes, plural. There's going to be several of them. In fact, there's going to be eight of them. Um, there's four peer processes, and then there's combinations of those things, just like there's four cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, and then there's combinations of those things. So on the chart, when something happens in the air conditioning process, and we're using air conditioning generically here to mean conditioning of all air, not to mean cooling necessarily, uh, but meaning conditioning any air, uh, I'm going to move a certain direction on the chart. So when I'm doing sensible heating, number one, sensible heating means I'm doing nothing with moisture, sensible only, no moisture. I will move straight across to the right. So if I add heat to the air, I move straight across to the right. Sensible cooling, which is very difficult to do, although we do it for some brief times, um, move straight to the left, meaning I don't do any dehumidification, just straight cooling, straight to the left. Humidification, adding moisture to the air, goes straight up. Dehumidification goes straight down, right? And the reason being, if you look at the chart, I got degrees along the bottom here. So when I move to the right, temperature goes up. When I move to the left, temperature goes down. And then the up and down, my absolute humidity, my specific humidity over here is vertical, up and down. That's why points three and four are up and down for humidification and dehumidification. Now in real life, it's difficult to do straight cooling, straight heating, straight humidification, straight dehumidification. Usually you're doing some of those things simultaneously. So if I was to do evaporative cooling, like I said with that swamp cooler, where I cool the air by adding moisture to it, then I would move up and to the left. Now, maybe it would be up and to the left this way, maybe it'd be more that way, depending on what I was doing, but I'm gonna move up and to the left. If I am doing uh, traditional cooling, like at your home or business, I'm going to be cooling the air, number two, and dehumidifying it, hopefully, number four, so I'm gonna end up with a result of number six. It may go like that, it may go on an angle this way, it may go on an angle that way, but it's gonna be down and to the left for cooling and dehumidification. If I'm running your humidifier while I'm in the heating mode, which normally we do that, um, and normally we do that because it's easier to add moisture to warm air than it is to add moisture to cool air. It's not impossible to add it to cool air, it's just harder. Why is it harder? Well, like we said, warm air can hold more moisture, has a lower relative humidity, which means it can absorb more moisture still. So we usually wait for the humidifier to run, we wait for the heating mode to happen. In any case, heating and humidity at the same time would be arrow number seven on here. And it could be any angle on here, but somewhere between one and three. And then heating and dehumidifying, which you would almost never do, but because there's direction on the chart, we gotta call it something. So I would be heating and dehumidifying, which would be rare for what we want to happen. I would be number eight on here. So those are all the processes we could have when we're, when we're doing HVAC related work. So let's get a little bit more into the cooling uh, loads and how I can equate that to the CFM that I'm going to need. Like I mentioned, uh, calculating the cooling and heating loads is a separate discussion from this particular course. Uh, hopefully you already know how to do that. If not, we have classes for that. Maybe some of you were even on the uh, residential rights off webinar this morning um, for uh, uh, load calcs. Um, you guys on the commercial side, uh, you probably have done HAP classes or something like that in the past, or God forbid, train trace. Um, I'm not saying that like it's a bad program, it's just, you know, competitor. Um, any case, so sensible heat. So this is our formula for sensible heat. This is kind of a truncated, truncated formula. Um, usually I use 1.08. Uh, in this particular uh, slide deck, they used 1.1, so we're going to roll with that. Um, once again, horseshoes and hand grenades for HVAC. When it comes down to it, I'm gonna have some giant ass air handler with a giant ass fan and a giant ass coil. So being super precise is not critical, but a little bit more precise would be nice. But in any case, we use 1.1. So here's our formula for heat. Uh, if you remember back to your psychometric or your thermodynamic days, we typically use Q to represent heat. So in this case, we're gonna use Q sub S for heat sensible. So the formula for heat sensible is 1.08, or excuse me, 1.1 for the purpose of these slides, times the CFM times the delta T. And if you have any decent skills with algebra, you can rearrange that formula to figure out whatever one you don't have, right? So if you know the heat, you know the delta T, and you want to learn the CFM, you can rearrange the formula, obviously. It would be Q divided by delta T um, divided by 1.1. Um, when I'm doing sensible heating on the chart, so if I take a point on here, sensible heating, as we said before, was straight to the right. When I do that, when I move from left to right on the chart, straight across, 
the wet bulb will in fact change. So if I take this first dot on the left over here, where I'm at 60 degrees, I move straight to the right. If I read on the diagonal, which is my wet bulb, I would have went from 54 wet bulb to 65 wet bulb. So when I do sensible heating, the wet bulb of the air is going to change. Sounds weird, like why is the wet bulb changing, dude? Like you didn't do anything with moisture. Well, psychometric chart explains why. The uh, dry bulb is obviously going to change when I heat the air. In this case, it's going from 60 to 90. Got it. The dew point remains constant. I'm on this straight line. Remember, dew point is red left to right. So dew point over here is 49. The dew point of this dot, 49. But nothing changed in that regard. When I look at latent heat, latent heat is going to be heat that I'm dealing with from the moisture perspective. It is going to be humidification or dehumidification. So latent heat goes straight up and down. So sensible heat goes left to right because I'm changing the temperature. Latent heat goes up and down because I'm changing the moisture content. Now in real life, we're gonna do combinations of those things, but right now we're just doing latent heat. So it goes up and down. The formula for latent heat is gonna be Q sub L, heat latent, is 0.69 times the CFM times delta grains. So in both cases, the CFM is a factor. There's a different constant for sensible and latent just to make all the units and everything work out. And then I have delta grains for latent because it's the change in the height of this thing, delta grains. Whereas sensible, it was the change in the width of these lines on the chart, delta T. So latent is 0.69 times the CFM times the change in grains. When I do that, I move from the top dot to the bottom dot, for example, to dehumidify. The wet bulb will change. The wet bulb on the top dot was, let's just say it was 67. The bottom dot, when I read it under 45 degree angle, is 55. Wet bulb went down. Dew point went down. The dew point was 65 when I read straight across here. Dew point's now 35. Dew point went down. Uh, the dry bulb did not change. It went straight up and down, so it was 75 and 75, straight up and down. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to most people. When I want to know the total heat of the amount of work I was doing, QT, Q sub T is total heat. It is the sensible heat plus the latent heat. So if I can measure both of these or plot both of these on the chart, then I can add the two numbers together to get the total heat. When you guys look at, say, um, Let's say you're doing a residential split system air conditioner and you look at the tables in the product data literature, you will see a column for uh, total cooling capacity and sensible cooling capacity. Uh, and then if you're smart enough, you can subtract the sensible from the total to get the latent. I don't know why we don't give you an extra column with the latent. I don't know if there's like a, a width problem on the piece of paper or something, um, but total, sensible, and latent can all be determined on those product data sheets. And that's really what's happening here is how much latent is it doing? Moisture removal. How much sensible is it doing? Temperature removal. And the total is the combination of those two things. So in this case, if I start out with the dot on the top right-hand side, 95 degrees over here on that top dot, if I was to cool the air sensibly, it moves to the left. And then if I dehumidify it, it moves downward. The total would be if I went from right to left on this diagonal. And the same thing can be in reverse. If I start at the bottom dot over here and I add heat, I go from left to right. I add moisture, I go from below to up. I'm going to end up at this dot on the right again. So it goes up and to the right. So when I'm doing sensible and latent at the same time, things move on the diagonal. All right, so I can use the enthalpy on my psychometric chart to figure out how much heat I have added or subtracted both sensible and latent. I can do them together or I can do them individually. We'll talk about both ways here so you know how both of them work. Um, so let's just take one of these dots on here. Um, so let's start at the top right dot where my little red circle is at here. Got the top right dot. I'm at 75 degrees temperature in this case. We'll pretend this is like a cooling dehumidification type example. If I read straight across, or excuse me, if I read 45 degree angle up, and I keep going to the little tiny gray lines, I get to the enthalpy, I'm at 27 and a half uh, BTUs for enthalpy. 
if I cool the air and I dehumidify the air, then I can read up on this guy and I see that he's at 20.8 is my ending result. The difference between 27 and a half and 20.8 is 6.7. I've done 6.7 BTUs of cooling. I've done 6.7 work, if you will. But it came from two places. Some of it came by moving from right to left, cooling, and some came from moving top down, latent. If I want to see how that would work, I could pretend that I did the two things separately. So let's say I just did dehumidification from top down. I moved from this dot to the bottom dot. If I drew his line up, he's at 25.8 BTUs. He was at 27.5. The difference between those two is 1.7. 1 so 1.7 BTUs of latent work was done. It's latent because I went from top down. I removed moisture. I did not do anything with temperature. I just removed moisture by going from here to here. So that's the 1.7. If I want to see the sensible, fine. Sensible goes from right to left. I can look at the difference between it that way. There to there. That's the rest of the, of the work, if you will. So that turned out to be five uh, BTUs of sensible. 5 plus 1.7, I'm back to my 6.7. Obviously, the sensible plus latent must equal the total directly. So if I want to have the formula for both, right? So my formula for sensible was 1.1 times the CFM times delta T. My formula for latent is 0.69 times CFM times delta grains. Then I could add the sensible and the latent together to get the total. Or if I already know the formula, I can look at the enthalpy on the chart and I could say the combination of those things, the formula would be for total heat would be 4.5, make all the units and constants work, 4.5 times the CFM times, in this case, delta enthalpy. H is the symbol we use for enthalpy. So instead of delta T and delta grains of moisture, I'm going to use delta enthalpy, which is the combination of the two things. Um, some of you guys probably don't do a lot of engineering work. You just do field work, which is which is a different discussion. And enthalpy comes up a lot in those cases too, specifically when you're working with the economizer. And we have a whole separate class on economizers if you're interested in that. Um, but we'll refer to enthalpy then. And a lot of people are like, what the hell is enthalpy, man? It's like a foreign concept. This is what enthalpy is. Enthalpy is the moisture energy and the temperature energy in combination with each other. It is temperature and humidity, if you will. Um, so a lot of times when we're doing economizer classes, instead of saying enthalpy, we'll refer to temperature and humidity so people can kind of pick it up a little bit faster. And even the new Honeywell Jade controller now no longer uses the word enthalpy anywhere on the screen. They just use temperature and humidity because uh, enthalpy is a little bit of a, of a foreign concept to some folks. But this should help you understand it a little better. Enthalpy is the combination of the temperature work and the um, moisture work, if you will. So this is our combined formula. Um, Total heat is 4.5 times the CFM times the delta enthalpy. And the delta enthalpy is right on these little gray lines on your chart. Delta enthalpy. All right, we also have this thing called sensible heat ratio or sensible heat factor, depending on what you, you want to word it as. Um, we use it sort of as a... Um, tech figure sometimes, like specifically when we're doing uh, cooling coil design and cooling coil selections, we want to make sure we have the ability to do enough latent removal with the coil that we're choosing for the kind of project that we have. Um, normal numbers, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, something like that uh, as a sensible heat ratio, meaning 75% of the work that my coil is going to do is sensible, 25% of it is latent. That kind of does stick along with what we just had over here. We did a small amount of latent relative to the sensible. Some projects, it'll need to be different, uh, but that's kind of a check figure that we use. Uh, if you wanna do it, figure it out yourself. Uh, it's the sensible heat, that's the enthalpy, divided by the total enthalpy. So if we did it on this one over here, what was our sensible? Our sensible was five, divided by our total was uh, 6.5. My brain is completely fried, so I'm gonna cheat and use my calculator. 5 divided by 6.7, we have a 0 0.746, 0 0.75 sensible heat ratio or sensible heat factor. That's a pretty normal cooling coil for a pretty normal application, normal meaning office, retail, classroom, that kind of thing. 
Uh, but you can use that as a check figure to make sure you're kind of in the right ballpark. If you have spaces that need a lot of dehumidification, like a process, then you should have a lower sensible heat ratio, below 0.7, if you have some kind of weird dehumidification process going on. Uh, well, in just time, we're going to skip that one to keep on moving here. All right, so um, I guess instead of my calculator, I could have just waited like another slide and it did the sensible heat ratio or sensible heat factor, same difference on here. On the site chart, you could also, instead of doing the math, you can use the lines on the very, very, very far right. Those little gray lines over there where it says 0 0.45, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, blah, 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 sensible heat factor, sensible heat ratio. You can use those lines. In this case, the way you read those, it's going to be the angle of your line. So I have this blue line here. What I would do is I would take a straight edge, and this is very hard for me to explain on the webinar without having a straight edge. But let's say I took a straight edge, like a ruler, and I lined it up with this blue line. I don't read straight across like that. I keep moving my, my ruler up and down. So I'd have a ruler that was this long from my left dot to my right dot, and I would keep sliding the whole ruler up until it had the right angle that I wanted. In this case, the 0.75 angle. This angle right here of the blue line is the same as the angle of this black line, the same slope, if you will. So it's kind of read a little bit differently. I need a long straight edge and I keep sliding it so it stays parallel to the blue line. I wish I had something better to do this with on here. Um, mm, yeah, I don't think there's anything I could use on the presentation thing. Let me just try one. One thing, uh, maybe not, maybe that's not gonna work. Uh, yeah, there's not really anything I can do, I don't think. Oh, maybe, I, how about did I do that? Hmm, that's only making it worse. <laughs> All right, let's pretend that I cannot do that because I'm not that smart. Go back to my laser pointer, pretend you did nothing, Ryan. Anyway, a straight edge to find the same slope would tell you the sensible heat ratio if you don't wanna do the math. All right. Quiz question number four. Total heat is the sum of which? A, temperature plus humidity, B, sensible plus latent, or C, temperature plus humidity plus air speed. Now I'm gonna look at the questions while you guys are doing that. If anybody has any questions, other than why my sound sucked for that seven minute span early on, which I apologize for. Any other questions, type them in that question chat box. I'm gonna do my best to address them here. Um, while you guys are doing that, Phil is asking, is this presentation available to watch again? Uh, yes, it is. I am recording it uh, and it will be available. Uh, I can send everyone who's on the webinar a link to it um, and you can watch it again. Um, and next week will also be recorded. I don't know that you want to watch it again because it's not that exciting, but maybe there's a coworker you want to send it to, or maybe you hire somebody new four months from now and you want them to do some psychometric basics. Um, you can definitely reuse this presentation again. Uh, uh, Jamin is asking if the presentation slides will be available. I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to give you a workbook that matches up with the slides. So it has all the slides on there, plus a couple paragraphs of description uh, that go along with the, each slide. Uh, and I'll send that to all of you guys uh, upon completion of the class. So you'll have that if you want to uh, re refer back to stuff as well. All right, so let's close this out. Everyone hopefully answered. If you didn't answer, do it in the next five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is B, sensible plus latent. And 93% of you guys got that correct. So you're doing well. Uh, let me put that back to the regular slide deck. Uh, let's see. Uh, presentation slides, yes slides, yes, watch the recording. Okay, I think we're all caught up on that. Okay, let's keep on moving here. All right, so quiz question number five. 
I am not going to launch quiz question number five until next Monday. But I'm going to give you the question now. And I'm going to have you download the psychometric chart that I posted on the PDF or your own or whatever one you want and answer this one basic question. Like I said, we normally have a whole bunch of working questions that we do in the workbook together in the, in the live classroom class, um, but we can't do most of those in here. So I just grabbed one of those and I'm giving it to you as an example here. So this one will be due. The very first thing we do on Monday next week when we're together on the webinar is we'll have this question come up and you guys will answer it. So you have a whole week to do one simple homework question. So the question is, I have an air duct having a surface temperature of 60 degrees and it passes through a space that is 90 degrees and 75 wet bulbs, so like an attic, for example. Is my duct going to sweat? Yes or no? You just got to use the psych chart to plot those things out and tell me if it's going to sweat. Yes or no? So I'm not going to launch that question now. We'll save that for later. I'm going to give you guys uh, 30 seconds to write it down or screenshot it or whatever you want to do. And if for some reason you have a problem with that, I can always email you the question later if you send me a note. By the way, my email is my name, Ryan, R-Y-A-N, dot Hoger, H-O-G-E-R, at T-E-C, Mungo, M-U-N-G-O, dot com. All right, let's do a few more slides here and then we'll be wrapped up for the day. Um, sensible heating process. So on these slides that we're using now and for the next hour, well, not hour today, but hour total. Um, on the left, the way the slides work is I have the a picture of something in the air handler, in this case, the heating coil. And point A is on the left side of the heating coil and point B is on the right side of the, of the heating coil. And what we're going to do is plot those things on the chart and use, excuse me, use the chart to see what is actually happening. So in this case, I have air coming into the heating coil. It's 70 degree air with 70, with, excuse me, with 54 degree wet bulb. That's what's coming into my coil. What's it going to leave at after I use my heating coil to heat it up? I have a thousand CFM of airflow in this example. So I'm going to plot the first point, point A on my chart. I know 70 degrees, I know 54 wet bulb by reading down the 45, there's my dot. I'm gonna do sensible heating only, so no, no change to moisture. I'm gonna heat it 30 degrees from 70 to 100. So I'm gonna move straight to the right, 30 degrees, boom. And then I'm gonna read my data points from there. So I'll read the wet bulb by going up. Well, now I'm at 65 wet bulb. My dew point is the same, because dew point is read this way. So A and B both have a dew point of 40. So I did the sensible heating. My dew point didn't change. Dew point, once again, meaning if for some reason it gets below 40 degrees, things are going to sweat. That's what the dew point means. When I heated the air, my wet bulb also went up. It doesn't seem super logical because a lot of us think of wet bulb in terms of moisture, which it does represent. Um, but it's also a function of how much moisture can be held. So my wet bulb was actually going to go up, even though I didn't add any moisture to it in this discussion. So I increased it 30 degrees, and it also happened to go up 11 wet bulb degrees. If I want to see the work done, the heat done, if you will, I go back to my formulas. Heat sensible is Q sub S. It's 1.1 times 1,000 CFM. And by the way, these slides use 1.1 instead of 1.08, just to make the math easy. So it's 1.1 times 1,000 CFM, times the delta T, which in this case was 30 degrees, that's 33,000 BTUs. I've added 33,000 BTUs per hour to this Airstream. By running it across my hot water coil or whatever my heating coil was, electric coil, whatever it was. If I do sensible cooling, it's gonna be the exact same thing in reverse. So now point A is going to be the hot air, and point B is going to be the cold air. And I'm going to, instead of going left to right, I'm going to go right to left. So I'm starting out with the exact same conditions I just had. 100 degrees, 65, and 40. But I'm going to run it through the opposite way. All right. So my 100 degrees is going to get cooled down to 70. My wet bulb is going to go from 65 to 54. If I look at it on the chart, I go from point A, 100, 30 degrees to the left, to point B, 70 degrees. And I read up on both of those. That guy reading up on point B is 54. Point A was 65, exactly the same thing we had when we had the heating in the other direction. So I did the exact same amount of work. If I do it mathematically, 
it's Q sub S, Q sensible is 1.1 times 1,000 CFM times the 30, delta, 30 degrees delta T, but now it just happens to be a negative number. So it's negative 33,000 BTUs. How much heat did I add to the air? I added a negative 33,000 BTUs. Saying I added a negative number sounds stupid, so nobody says that. We say we removed 33,000 BTUs. And in fact, most times we don't even use the negative sign. We just know that we're doing a cooling process. So we do 100 minus 70, 33,000 BTUs of cooling. But mathematically, it'd be more proper to have it to be a negative 33,000. We only can add or remove heat. We remove 33,000 BTUs per hour of heat on the sense of a cooling. If we do dehumidification, it's an up and down at this point. No left to right, just up and down. In this example, once again, I have my air handler over here, but instead of a heating coil or a cooling coil, I have a dehumidifier. And somehow it's like a magical dehumidifier that doesn't accidentally cool the air. That's not a product that exists in the world. Um, well, I guess it does. You could cool, you could dehumidify and cool, and then immediately reheat right there. So let's pretend it's all in one box, right? All in one little coil of some sort. So I'm dehumidifying only, so my 80 degrees stays 80 degrees. But I'm going to pull moisture out of the air, which means I'm going to go up and down on the chart. So I'm going to go from point A down to point B, removing moisture, removing grains of moisture. So I'm going to have a delta grains represented here. So in this case, I'm going to plot these two points out, A, 80 degrees and 70 wet bulb. I read that straight up. That also happens to be 65 degree dew point. I'm going to pull the grains of moisture out and move down on here. If I read my chart there, it's still 80 degrees, but I read across over this way, it's going to be 62 wet bulb instead of 70. And if I read my dew point there, this chart doesn't line up very well to the graph over here. I apologize for that. But if I read my dew point over here, let's just follow what they have, 50 degree dew point. Mathematically, the heat uh, removal is Q sub L, Q sub latent. The formula, if you recall, is 0 0.69 times the CFM times the delta grains. In this case, I went from 94 to 54. So I removed, uh, what is that? 64, 70, 44, 94. I removed 40 grains of moisture. So it's a negative 40 in there. So I end up with negative 27,600 BTUs per hour. Once again, it's a negative number because I removed the heat, removed the latent heat. You wouldn't say that. You would say I removed 27,600. You wouldn't say I added negative 27. You'd say I removed 27 but same difference. All right, humidification, um, which is the opposite. And uh, this may be one of our last ones for today. In fact, this will probably be our last slide for today. Um, humidification is the opposite. Now I'm gonna add moisture to the air, but not change its temperature. Once again, that's very difficult to do, but let's just pretend I can do that for right now. So 80 degrees comes into this humidifier and 80 degrees leaves the humidifier. So I'm gonna go straight up on here from point A up to point B. I'm going to raise it from 62 degree uh, wet bulb to 70 degree wet bulb. I'm gonna go from 50 dew point to 65 dew point by adding this water, adding this moisture to it. My formula stays the same, 0.69 times my CFM times my delta 40 grains of moisture. I get 27,600 BTUs per hour. In this case, it's additive because I've added the heat. So just to be clear, sensible heating adds dry heat. Sensible cooling removes heat. Dehumidification removes latent heat. Humidification adds latent heat. Once again, it's very difficult to do just one of those things without the other. Usually we're doing sensible and latent simultaneously, um, but conceptually right now, this is how we're looking at it. So with that, we're gonna wrap up here. Um, let me show you two things before I do that. One, quiz question. If you didn't have that, you need to answer this quiz question when we come back next Monday at 10 a.m. Central Time. An air duct having a surface of 60 degrees passes through a space of 90 degree dry bulb, 75 wet bulb. Will the duct, duct sweat, yes or no? I put that back up because several people asked me to put it back up. So take a screenshot, take it with your camera, screenshot with software on your computer, email me later if you didn't figure out any of those methods of getting it. The other thing that I want you to have before we go, uh, no, do not keep my ink annotations. 
um, is that when you, like I said before, if you want more webinar material, if you go to our website, tcmungo.com and go to training, click on the training tab, down there in the middle, you'll see the other webinars we have coming up. Specifically, tomorrow's webinar is on chilled water optimization. Just like this course, it's also a PDH webinar. It's a one hour course. It's not multiple days like this one. It's just a one, one hour course. Mike Smid, our, uh, our executive VP on commercial is going to be leading that for us. Um, so if you do chiller work and you wanna know how to design chiller plants that are more efficient than other chiller plants, uh, jump on that tomorrow with Mike. All you'd have to do is go here and then just click on it. It'll bring up the link for you to register. You probably also got an email in your inbox if you're on our mailing list. If you're not on our mailing list, you will be after today. All right, let's see if there's any questions before we finalize here. I'm gonna put the slides back up for anybody that's following along at home. All right. Uh, all right, some people are answering the quiz question. Uh, I'm gonna put that quiz question up on Monday for you to answer, um, next Monday. Um, Brian asks, where can I find the form to get credits? Uh, you don't need to do anything. If you said you were a PE on needed PDHs when you registered and you answer the quiz questions correctly, meaning you answer five of the eight questions correct, then you will automatically get a PDH certificate. Those will be emailed to you probably one week after next week. Uh, we got to grade them and then type them all out and then send them out. Uh, Michael asks, is the 1,000 CFM in your example a fixed number? Uh, in this case, it's just a, a random error handler example. We could have just as easily used 5,000 or 10,000 or 300 CFM, but for the purposes of the slides, to make math super easy, 1,000 is easy to multiply out. So Michael, we just happen to use 1,000. The amount of CFM would in fact be different for your given project. Now, what's going to happen in real life is you're gonna start with the load. So in this case, you're gonna start with having calculated that your, your space needs 33,000 BTUs of heat. That's just how much heat you need to add to the space because of your load calc. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the 33,000 already from other means, load calculation. You're going to know what discharge air temperature you want to design for, in this case, 100 degrees. You're gonna know what return air you're likely to expect back, 70 degrees. There's my 30 degree delta T, the 1.1 is constant. So what you can do is solve that to figure out that you needed 1000 CFM to move that many BTUs. You can either change the temperatures or you can change the CFM to get those BTUs. Those are the only two things you can change though in real life design. I need 33,000 BTUs to heat the structure. I got 70 degree air in my, in my space. I can, I'm choosing to add 30 degrees. If I chose to only add 20 degrees, then I would need more CFM. If I chose to add 40 degrees of heat temperature, go from 70 to 110, then I would need less CFM to make the math work out. Uh, Paul asks if I'm going to send the chart. You guys should be able to on the handout box. Uh, so if you don't see the handout box, go up to the top where it says File, Options, View, check Handouts. Then you should have a handout box that you can expand with a little arrow. And then it'll say psychchart.pdf. You can click on that and save that psych chart. If for any reason you're not able to do that, send me an email and I will reply back to you with a psych chart. Uh, some people are asking about when slides will be available. Next Monday, I will give you the workbook that has all of the slides and all of the uh, paragraph descriptions explaining what each slide means. So I'll do that on next Monday. I'll send it to everybody. Uh, Philip asks, what is the most difficult calc using the psychometric chart? Um, I don't think any of the calculations are particularly difficult uh, once you understand what they mean, but measuring some of the variables in the field are very difficult. Like I said, the easiest one is to measure is dry bulb. The second easiest one historically has been wet bulb. It's very difficult to measure absolute uh, specific humidity. Uh, it's very difficult to measure, measure dew points. Um, Enthalpy is like impossible to measure. Um, so wet bulb and dry bulb are the two easiest to measure. Calculations based on those things, I don't think are very difficult at all once you know the formulas that you wanna deal with. All right, so I don't see any more questions. 
Uh, oh, maybe we do have a couple more questions. Uh, Phil Philip asks, do you have any software recommendation instead of the psychometric chart? Uh, I don't personally use any software tools um, f to plot psychometric processes out. I like to do it old school. I know that's plain and boring. Uh, I do have apps on my phone. I do I have gone to websites to plot stuff out mainly because I want to have a, a screenshot I can then send to someone versus the psych chart on my desk, which is difficult to send to someone. Um, but I don't have any particular favorites. Um, one of our competitors, Munters, has a nice website for plotting out psych charts. Um, probably shouldn't tell people about a competitor's website, but whatever. Um, but I don't recommend that you start using websites to plot out, plot out processes until you first understand how the processes work. So if you can't plot them manually on paper, on a psych chart on paper, you're probably not ready to use a software tool. Just like you're not ready to do long division on a calculator until you can do long division on paper. Uh, Warland asks, if I happen to have a physical chart that I can hand out. I do not have anything that I can hand out readily uh, on paper right now. Uh, if we were in a classroom, obviously I would, but I don't really have any way to get you that now. So if I printed something or ordered something or whatever, I wouldn't have any way to really do that now. Uh, but if you come to any of our TDP classes, which we normally run in the fall, it's a, oh, what is it now? 13 week class where we meet like four hours a week for like 13 weeks, um, different topics. So uh, comfort fundamentals, psychometrics, load estimating, killers, uh, error handlers, uh, acoustics, like a different topic every week uh, in the fall uh, when we do that class. Uh, we do the same kind of thing we're doing now, but with physical uh, laminated charts, which are nice because then you can use dry erase marker to plot everything out and then wipe it off, which is beautiful. I do not have a way to get you that right now. All right. I am going to wrap things up for today. If you had anything that was uh, difficult or confusing, send me a note and I will see you guys next Monday at 10 a.m. to do part two of this psychometric discussion.